Good morning and welcome to the Wednesday, June 9th, 2010 edition of the Investigative Journal. I'm your host, Greg Szymanski. You're listening to LibertyRadioLive.com. And today my guest is author Eric John Phelps, also a radio broadcaster. And Eric uh, has a website called VaticanAssassins.org. I recommend you go there if you want to learn the truth about uh, the Jesuit order in America. And every time, uh, like I said last week, uh, when I had Eric and I'd have him back on for another appearance, every time I want to get the juices flowing and uh, understand really what the Jesuit order is all about, I call on Eric. And Eric, today, I just wanted to start out this way. I get, I'm getting a lot of emails that are getting me a little bit angry that people just aren't getting it. Uh, the war on terror, uh, Islam, all of this uh, hatred that's being mounted against people, uh, but no one really understands this kind of, You know, there are people that do, but the majority of people just don't get it. Uh, when we tell them that uh, terrorism was orchestrated here, the Muslim people are being used by the uh, Vatican, just like the American people, and this hatred is being whipped up to create a war to kill off the good people of both uh, uh, Christians and Muslims. And I wanted to get this set the record straight. Let's start out by saying this statement. Uh, I want you to prove to us, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the Vatican created Islam. And uh, silence some of these email critics I get, because I'm getting tired of it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, if the, your listeners would like to go to my broadcast of the last two Fridays, the last previous Fridays, they can listen to uh, Count Vittorio Vivaldi III out of Venice, who uh, very well shows that the Islam is a creation of the Vatican. And uh, we also can see that the essential tenets of Islam are the exact same tenets of Romanism. Islam has jihads, Romanism has crusades. Islam has a central city, Mecca. Vatican has a papacy, uh, Roman Catholicism has a central city in Rome. Uh, Islam counts beads. They have little beads that they count. So does Romanists. They have, uh, it's, it's very, very many, many identical things. I have ten uh, strong points that I've posted on the absolute similarity of Islam and Catholicism. And what the Count surprised me with was that he said that the papacy has always been in control of Islam. That's why Saladin was good to the, to the people, allowed them to leave Jerusalem after he had conquered Jerusalem. And why he had killed 230 Knights of Malta and Knights Templars. He was killing these Knights of Malta and Knights Templars because they were essentially enemies of the papacy. <laughs> they wouldn't rule the kingdom of Jerusalem for the Pope. <laughs> so Saladin killed 230 of them. I mean, if we go on and on, we can see, for example, the war in Serbia by, uh, uh, in the 1990s by uh, Croatia and the Albanian Muslims. Uh, this is a continuation of using Islam to destroy the Orthodox Christian people. Uh, we see that uh, when, when Constantinople was conquered in 1453, it falls, they behead the last Greek emperor there, and the second Rome, which, is, which Constantinople was called, falls to Islam, that creation of the papacy. So there are many, many, many evidences of it. Wherever Islam raises its sword, it always kills for the benefit of the Pope. They don't go and kill all the Roman Catholic people. They don't kill the Roman hierarchy. They kill non-papal Christians, the Orthodox, the Protestants, and Jews, as well as furthering the temporal power of the Pope. Yeah, you know, two things, you know, I'm just going to use a country as an example here, because I was just checking it out the other day. I'm just going to talk about uh, Morocco, and I'm going to bring it up for this reason. For example, here in America, we see a hidden agenda regarding how uh, the ecumenical movement works and basically how one day here you're going to have to worship the way the Pope wants you or forget about it. Now behind the agenda we have things like Waco, we have other things going on that make it pretty difficult for a biblical American to exist here in this country. Uh, but you still can do it openly, so to speak, unquote. Now you go to a country like Morocco and you find that uh, boy, if you start uh, preaching Christianity there there are laws against it uh, and that is all over the Muslim world now tell us about why it's in place this way I know, I know you understand this quite well but you'll, you'll find that Christians can't uh, practice Christianity in a Muslim world but here in America we see that Muslims are welcome in open arms I think it's to create some type of friction don't you? 
Of course, it creates friction, but it also <laughs> it also prevents the preaching of the true gospel to the Arab peoples. Because we have to remember that there are only two racial peoples in the Bible that have biblical promises to inherit. The racial Hebrew Jewish Israelites and the racial sons of Ishmael, which we know today as the Arabs. And so therefore the papacy seeks to do its best to keep the true gospel from going to the Arab peoples, for which reason it created Islam in the first place to kill out all the non-papal, Bible-believing Christians who are, who are Arabs in Arabia and then North Africa. And so they continue with this quest. They don't want to have the gospel there because if the gospel goes to the Arab people, they might begin to have prosperous civilizations and a middle class and a people then that would rise up and say, listen, the papacy has always been our historical enemy. Yeah, good point. And I wanted to, I wanted to mention this. Can you explain to us from your research uh, how the papacy created Islam? Uh, can you give us some historical facts? It's a huge subject, but just touch on some of the main points going back in history to lay a foundation for what we're saying. According to the Count and according to ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera, the Augustinians in North Africa tutored Muhammad. They taught him. And according to the Count, the Quran was written in Rome. Muhammad never wrote that. He never received it in a vision. And so therefore... Um, Islam, and when you see this happening, then you can understand wh uh, why Islam never persecuted the Augustinians, the North African Christians. Remember, Augustine was a pagan. The four, the four primary theologians for Roman Catholicism, one of them is considered, all of them considered that some of the fathers of Roman Catholicism of the papacy, doctrinally. And the foremost is Augustine. <laughs> Augustine hated the Jews. And so, therefore, the Augustinians imbibed their hatred for Jews in a religion that they had created for Arabs, who are the natural enemies of the Jews, pursuant to the Bible. That the sons of Ishmael would always be uh, against the sons of Isaac. And so they fashioned a religion for the Arab people to fit this biblical controversy between the sons of Isaac and the sons of, uh, sons of Ishmael. And thus Islam never persecutes from a Catholicism. In fact, Islam goes into Spain about the 8th century. And Islam goes into Spain and Portugal area. And it conquers the Visigoths. The Visigoths were non-Roman Catholic Christians. And after they used Islam to kill out the Visigoths or drive them over the Pyrenees into France, then the Vatican uses its military to drive the Muslims ultimately out of Spain. And by 1606, they're out. So we see many, many examples of Islam being used to destroy the enemies of the papacy. And why? Because Islam created it in North Africa by the Augustinians tutoring Muhammad. And one of Muhammad's wives, wives had been a Roman Catholic nun. Yeah, that's interesting when you look at his life. And now we're talking, what, in the 7th, 8th century now? The 7th century. 7th century, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and... When you start reading the Quran, you see so many similarities to Roman Catholicism, don't you? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a warlike religion, exactly as the papacy. It calls for the conversion of the infidel with a sword, just as Roman Catholicism calls for the conversion of the heretic with a sword. As Thomas Aquinas wrote in his Summa Theologica, and I have it quoted in my book. They're identical. So now let's fast forward to 9-11. And you see, well, you see throughout uh, the 1960, you know, I'd like to talk about that for a moment, then we'll hit 9-11, because we've, we've, in a sense, left it off the table on many radio shows, uh, connecting the dots between how terrorism was orchestrated by the Jesuits. We hear about 9-11, and there's still constantly information coming out about really what happened. But, and by, and by, by the way, before I forget, I put a recent post up on my website on Tim Risser. Okay, And that relates to him implying that 9-11 was an inside job on June 1st, 2008. And 12 days later, he's dead. Yeah, interesting. I was just talking about him with a friend the other day, too. Let's, uh, let's hold that thought and maybe touch on him in the second half hour, but I wanted to get back. Uh, many people don't realize the Jesuit roots in Iraq 
and how they were kicked out of the country, I believe, in the late 1960s. I think we could start there and then move our way into how terrorism has been orchestrated and how uh, these organizations have been fomented by Western money uh, to create this controversy between Muslims and Christians now that's going on in the world. Go ahead. Start in the 60s with the Jesuits in, in uh, Iraq. Interesting. Okay, let me, let me go a little bit before that, Greg, if okay. I can. Um, when Muhammad died, there became a schism between the Muslim people as to who would be his successor. The ones that chose the successor to be Ali were the ones that were called then the Shia Muslims. And so we have this schism after the death of Muhammad between the Sunnis and the Shia. And they are mortal enemies one toward another. The Sunnis hate them and regard them as infidels. And so the Shia now, because the Shia are also really the enemies of the papacy, because the Sunni Islam was created by Rome. Sunni, uh, Shia Islam was not created by Rome. And so now we have this enemy of the papacy called Shia Islam. And even Suleiman the Magnificent fought against the Shia. Um, uh, Saladin fought against the Shia, according to the count. And so Shia are the target, because to have a unified Islam against the West, you have to neutralize the Shia peoples. Where do they live? They live in southern Lebanon, they live in Iraq, they live in Iran, they live in Afghanistan, and some of them live in, I believe, a portion of Somalia. That's all. That's only where the Shiites live. So, therefore, this crusade, this crusade with... Uh, in 1960, I'll go to 1960 now, the Jesuits had a very lovely university in Baghdad called Baghdad University. I believe it was the New York province, either the Maryland province or the New York province, that had established this Baghdad University in uh, Iraq for the purpose, of course, training its leaders and its leaders would then be subject to the papacy. Um, in 1969, the Shia of Iraq expelled the Jesuit order from their country. Now that is what, very what, Why did they do that? Because they're meddling in politics like they, they do were, here? That's right, because they were meddling in their politics. So the Shia wouldn't put up with it. So they kicked them out. And some of the leaders uh, then were, went down in airplane crashes shortly after that. In 1971, the Jesuits bring the Ba'ath Party to power and put Saddam Hussein in power. And what does he do? He persecutes the Shia people of Iraq. He involves them in the Iraq-Iranian war so the Shia can mutually kill each other. And all of this is financed by the U.S. Jesuit-controlled uh, government, because if you read a tremendous book called, uh, uh, I think it's called Spider's Web, it's The Illegal Army of Iraq by Friedman, he shows you during the Reagan administration for eight years that his administration armed both sides, Iraq and Iran, during the Iraq-Iranian war because they want to kill off all the Shia. And you see some pictures that are float, still floating around of Donald Rumsfeld seeming very friendly with Saddam Hussein as they're shaking hands and wondering, you know, I'm wondering what they're talking about behind the scenes, but I guess we can fill in the, the gap here. Uh, they're probably, again, fomenting war there, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Shia peoples of Iraq and Iran have to be brought down in order to, organ to completely unify Islam. It's just like you have to completely bring down all Protestant sects. Just like this heretic we heard about in the middle of the news broadcast. Uh, you have to bring down all Protestant sects and submit them to the Pope by the National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches. And you've got to do the same thing with the Orthodox. You've got to subject the Orthodox Christian Church to the primacy of the Bishop of Bishops in Rome. So they, uh, they have the same principle applied to Islam. You must subject the Shia to the Pope of Rome and since they won't submit we have to kill them and then they will submit to our Sunni leaders and then our Sunni leaders will lead the way in the crusade against the West so right now they are conducting a crusade against the Shia Muslims we see this very same thing when, uh, when Israel invades in 2006 into southern Lebanon of course Hezbollah started it but Hezbollah is run by the Knights of Malta 
And, and the Knights of Malta ran in Hezbollah with their, with their hospital there in the border, according to the count in southern Lebanon. They then recruit all the young Shia men to fight in Hezbollah and then incite Israel to come and invade uh, southern Lebanon, which they never won, and kill the Shia people. So it's a war on the Shia of all fronts. I believe when they detonate Detroit, there's the largest Shia Muslim population in the United States in Detroit. They're going to go up in smoke. It's all yeah. a crusade now against the Shia. You know, I want to talk about that, uh, what you just said about Detroit. But first, uh, just give us just a little bit of background. So we have the papacy creating Islam. How did this schism happen? Where did, uh, why did the Shia, uh, Shiites rebel against the papacy what was the main reason there that you found out as i perceive it the papacy being in control of muhammad wanted to continue its absolute control over islam after his death with his successor that um, succeeded him that was a sunni i can't remember his name right now and with this with this uh, ali laying claim to being the descendant of muhammad the Muslims who followed him, they became what is called Shia. And this now was totally out of control of the papacy. <laughs> papacy now is learning, learning, losing control of this sect called the Shia through Ali. And so the Jesuits now in control of the Jesuit papacy have to rid the, the Islam of this, of, this, of this schism so that Islam can be united for the purposes of the papacy. And one of those purposes is to be used against North America. I think we, you know, looking at, well, okay, the Jesuits thrown out of uh, Iraq. We have our uh, domestic and foreign policy being, can we see the uh, ties between uh, Spellman back in the uh, Vietnam War? And we move our way into now this uh, war on terror after uh, communism falls, uh, and that is orchestrated as well. But just for uh, uh, just a refresher course, People may not be able to get their mind around how uh, our government, how the Jesuit order, can create a terrorist organization that can work its way into America, do the damage they've done on 9-11, and then create this whole propaganda campaign that the people of Islam are all behind this so that they can whip up a war between the two. So tell us how this is funded how they can operate this way, how the Jesuit order really works behind the scenes so that when people uh, present this premise, they can back it up. Because most okay. people in America still believe uh, that uh, the Jesuits have nothing to do with 9-11. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, to begin with, we have to remember there weren't any Muslims on those airplanes. The airplanes were empty. Um, those airplanes were guided into the buildings by the military industrial complex of this country. And as I've said for 10 years now, George J. Tenet, Knight of Malta, the DCI at the time, Director of Central Intelligence, a Roman Catholic, trained by Jesuits at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service, he was the mastermind of 9-11. So therefore, this Knight of Malta, George J. Tenet, his master at the time then, was the head of the of the federal branch of the Knights of Malta, which at the time was Edward Cardinal Egan. Edward Cardinal Egan was the Archbishop of New York City. He's now been replaced by Timothy Dolan. And so Edward Cardinal Egan was the, was the Darth Vader, was the overseer of the entire 9-11 scenario using his DCI George J. Tennant, just as Cardinal Spellman was the overseer of the assassination of JFK using his Knight of Malta DCI, John McCone. It's the same system, but with different players. Now, with this 9-11 with this that they brought about, they then uh, justified a crusade into Afghanistan in the following month. Uh, Afghanistan, was, Afghanistan was invaded on October 7th, 2001. October 7th is a very important day in history because it's on October 7th, 15, 15, uh, what, 1571, that the Battle of Lepanto was fought between the forces of Suleiman the Magnificent and the, the Holy Roman Emperor with his Knights of Malta and the Jesuits. 
And the Battle of Lepanto in 1571 is considered the most important sea battle in world history, second only to the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, when Octavian defeated Cleopatra's fleet and then went down to Egypt, killed her, and took over the kingdom. So this Battle of Lepanto is extremely important for the listeners to remember because on October 7th it took place, Suleiman was defeated, the Middle East was then was opened up to the Crusaders once again, and it's on this very same October 7th day that the U.S. invades Afghanistan. Mm. So they start the crusade of 7th, 2001, against the Shia of Afghanistan, primarily. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of where it starts, and so now here we have it. And then the other thing I want to stress is that because the vast majority of white people in this country are ignorant as to these historical facts, they are successfully being herded into right-wing white Jesuit fascism. I just saw a guy emailed me a, a truck with a bumper sticker on it, and it has uh, the Twin Towers burning. He said, I learned all that I need to lo lo know on 9-11. But I learned all I need to know on Islam about 9-11. And so, and it was a, a redneck somewhere down in the south, somewhere. He had a Confederate flag, and he, had, uh, and he had this painted on the back of it. And I thought, this is exactly what they're doing. They're inciting these people, these white people primarily, to unite under a fascist resistance and fight this crusade because they refuse to believe that 9-11 was an inside job of this government. Exactly. And then if we start really looking behind the scenes and looking at all the facts that prove that, uh, we have to go one step farther and then decide, you know, and try to uncover who was behind it and how they orchestrate these things. And that's where it's very important to begin to look at the Jesuit order behind the scenes and all of their shenanigans throughout the course of history seems to be uh, forgotten by the American people, and this is why they can get away with it. Uh, you make a right. fact in your book, Vatican Assassins, uh, that they've been kicked out of uh, over 80 countries in, in world history, and this is only since the 1530s when they were formed, correct? From the 1540 to, what, about 1931, according to Jesuit uh, Thomas Campbell, who was the former president of Fordham University, he lists 83 countries, cities, and states that they had been expelled from since their creation. Hmm. But the other point I wanted to make was that uh, the question is, well, how do you th what makes you think the Jesuit order did this if, if it's Cardinal Egan and the Knights of Malta? The point of my book is that the Jesuits have been in complete control of the Jesuit pa of the papacy since no later than 1814, after their formal revival by a bull issued by Pope Paul VII. And in that bowl, he gives them all their previous privileges and immunities. And in about 1886 or so, Pope Leo XIII was poisoned. And he was approached by a Jesuit and said, Listen, you've been given a poison that we only have the antidote. And he said, You will sign this bull, giving us all of our previous power back. And if you don't, you're going to die. If you do, we'll give you the antidote. And so Leo XIII signed the, signed the bull. He was given the antidote and he lived. Yeah, interesting, and so now we had the same, the same thing going on. To you know, one thing I wanted to mention regarding uh, Cardinal Spellman, uh, when I interviewed a New York police detective who was working on a pedophile problem, his name was Gene uh, or Jim Rostein. He mentioned that uh, it was well known that Spellman was considered to be one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, man in America, and uh, that has just carried on. In fact. Okay, my guest is Eric John Phelps, author of Vatican Assassins. You can go to his website at vaticanassassins.org. Uh, you can buy that book if you uh, haven't. And I tell you, it's, uh, it's well worth reading. A lot of facts in there that uh, kind of put the puzzle together because everybody wonders what's really going on in America, what's happening behind the scenes. Well, this is really what's happening. And uh, the real clue is that you don't hear about it in the mainstream media. Yes, it's the things you don't hear about that really are causing the problems in America. And if you can cut the roots of the tree out, you might get to the, you might topple this uh, evil tree that's been growing here in this country. Uh, we can talk about a number of things happening uh, just today. We can look at the Gulf Coast. Uh, Eric, you mentioned uh, terrorism on the on the threshold here, maybe in Detroit. But I wanted to just finish this up by uh, talking about that recent flotilla 
that peace flotilla that was going to Gaza, boarded by Israelis, and then this uh, firefight began. Uh, how do you view that as uh, the spark that's going to start off uh, this huge conflict in the Middle East that's going to flow into this country? What's your thoughts? Well, I think that's part of it, but I think the spark that's going to cause it is when Israel attacks Iran, because that's going to happen. Um, I believe the purpose for this whole flotilla fiasco, remembering, of course, that the Arabs have no right to Gaza. They only have a right outside the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his physical descendants. And that doesn't include Gaza, that doesn't include the West Bank, and it doesn't include the Golan Heights. That's all Israeli, Jewish, Hebrew land. And they have no right to it whatsoever. So now, uh, the, they're, they're, what they've done is they have created this agitation. It's the Pope's agitation. Remember, he's the one that's established Gaza. He's the one that's established West Bank. He's the one that wants to establish uh, uh, East Jerusalem for the Muslims. This is all from the papacy. Remembering, the papacy always benefits from every dialectic, every conflict, every agitation that it creates. And uh, so what they're doing is is <laughs> they are seeking to unite the Muslim world against Israel and against the U.S. And part of this unification involves the breaking away of Turkey out of the Turkey that was created by the Freemason and mass murderer uh, Atat Ataturk in 1922. Ataturk did away with Sharia law. And Turkey, after it had killed approximately two million Muslim, two million Armenian non-papal Christians in the Armenian massacre, which Turkey denies to this day, by the way, uh, all killing them for the benefit of the papacy because the papacy hates the, hates the Orthodox Armenians, and Islam wielded the sword to kill them. So Turkey is being driven out of its uh, somewhat neutral position as it had all the way through NATO when it was the southern flank of NATO and now through this Gulen movement, the Tula Gulen, uh, this man who is probably the most influential Muslim now in the world who has biv who went into a voluntary exile in Pennsylvania here. <laughs> so you know the Maryland Provincial is allowing this uh, Gulen leader to live here and he has a protected compound up near the Poconos somewhere. Now what they're doing is using this Gulen movement, they are driving Turkey into the real anti-Jew camp. Tur Israel did a lot of business with Turkey. Yeah, and this flotilla originated in Turkey, right? Out of Turkey, that's right. Yeah. And, the, and the count tells me this is the Gulen movement. Well, this makes perfect sense because the Gulen movement wants to unite Islam for the creation of a new caliphate in the Middle East, out of Baghdad out of what used to be the center for the Ottoman Empire. And so, what we have here is Turkey being pushed in this direction. Now all the Turks are boycotting Israel, exactly what the Pope wants. And this will also be another reason for the Pope to say, well, Turkey, you're not going to get in the European Union. The papacy has never wanted Turkey in the European Union, and it will never be. The only part of uh, whatever was once Turkey was uh, southern Cyprus, which is Greek Orthodox, there in the EU, but northern Cyprus, which is Turkish, which was taken from the Greeks in 1974 by Henry Killinger, is not in the EU. So this whole thing is to keep Turkey out of the EU. It is to unite Turkey on the side of the Islamic world that will be in league with Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And um, this this move, you know, when, what... Uh you mentioned that you know we we see now. Let's move back to America here. Uh, what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico? The blackening of the oceans, uh, as I call it. Uh, could it be environmental terrorism, Eric? Um, I think so. I think they're they are they're accomplishing several things with this because I do not believe it was an accident. It was not. It was not an accident that they decided not to put on their equipment that would have only cost $500,000. It was not an accident. <laughs> it was not an accident that Halliburton was the la were the last people to leave the, the uh, uh, rig before it blew up. So there are many, many anomalies here that lead us to the, the, the same conclusion that it was no accident. Therefore, since it was not an accident, the question is, who benefits? We always must ask this question, who benefits? Well... We know that the papacy, in its control of China, and its control of Russia, and its control of the Islamic Sunni world, is planning an invasion of the American Southeast. 
And I cover this in my book. That is why Jimmy Carter and the Congress gave the Panama Canal locks to, to Panama, which later then leased out its running to a red Chinese company called Hutchinson Wimpoa. So the Chinese run the locks in Panama, and they're building a huge new Panama Canal there that will be finished according to their estimates in 1215. The Chinese are manning the locks, the red Chinese. Second of all, you have the Bahamas, which is the largest container shipping port in the Eastern Hemisphere for the most part, and China is there in the Bahamas. China is manning all the intelligence in Cuba, because you see Cuba was given to Jesuit uh, communist Fidel Castro to serve as a staging base for the invasion of America way back in 1960. That's why it was given to him. That's why Alan Dulles made sure that the Bay of Pigs fiasco failed. So we have this encirclement policy of China right now. China's going into Jamaica. My black Jamaican friends tell me that lots of young Chinese there taking all their jobs. So we have this going on. Now you have Russia with a submarine and a couple of big bombers out of Venezuela. They're, they have their encirclement movement. And with this oil spill, I believe, I believe that if it continues, there will be a mandatory evacuation of the southeast coast. And when they evacuate those people out of the southeast coast, say, what, 250 miles in, you now have a clue. <laughs> you now can invade because you have nobody to resist you. Remember, especially those southerners, those Mississippians and Alabamans, they're all armed to the teeth. Mm -hmm. So we got to get those people out of the way to have a successful invasion base. Uh, that's one advantage. Another advantage is, um, remember, the BP is controlled by the Knights of Malta, specifically Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. She owns Royal Dutch Shell, which is a part of British Petroleum. And you have Queen Elizabeth II, who's a dame of Malta. Both of them Bilderbergers, by the way. And uh, so they have orchestrated this for this particular reason. And Juan Carlos is involved in this, too. And he is presently using his company of Centro to build the Trans-America Cor Trans-Texas Corridor I-69 through Mexico to the U.S. and to Canada. And that will only happen with military protection. To, for that to happen, U.S. has to invade Mexico. There has to be a reason to invade Mexico. Maybe the oil spill will serve as that reason. Yeah, and I mean, we we don't know if the, when the, there's an end to that. I mean, there's a, so it's such uh, we don't even know how much is flowing out of that. Uh, what they may even consider a I call it a volcanic eruption of oil under the sea that is now. I know recent NASA photos, uh, and some of them haven't even been allowed to be released. They've now claimed this to be a national security incident uh, that I've read about. Uh, Claim that the spill is even larger than the state of Florida itself. Hmm. Well, it's no doubt going to be used to justify uh, martial law. I mean, Obama, Joe Biden, really. Joe Biden sent uh, uh, what uh, SWAT teams to every offshore rig in the country now. Why did he send a SWAT team? Why didn't he send investigators? Mm -hmm. What they're going to do? They're going to nationalize the oil. Oil will be nationalized, just like they nationalize the banks, just like they nationalize the auto industry. They're going to nationalize oil. And this is part and partial of a fascist government. Fascism is always the unification between the cartel capitalists and the government of that country that these very same white cartel capitalists control. Now, let's move over to the other borders in Mexico. Let's move over to Mexico and uh, talk about what's, uh, what's happening there in your recent research. How is that movement uh, also, the illegal aliens situation, creating a weakness on that part of our country in the West? Okay, okay the, this is designed, this has been a design by the Jesuit order to, to Catholicize our southwestern border since 1876. And this is documented by Richard W. Thompson in his great work, The Papacy and the Civil Power, written in 1876. And so with this Jesuit design of bringing all these lower class uh, Mexicans into the country, uh, they are being, the Jesuits in Mexico are making sure they're leaving, and the Jesuits here are making sure they're coming in. And the staging base for uh, coming into the U.S. is the Jesuit stronghold of Arizona. And I posted something about this recently. It's called the San Xavier um, Mission. 
uh, near Nogales. It's not too far from the Mexican border. And this is where I believe the Jesuits with their stronghold, set up by Eusebio Quino, who is the, considered to be the father of the cattle country, uh, the Jesuits are orchestrating this huge invasion through Arizona, and it will not stop. In fact, they've now incited more of this through a good piece of legislation that was signed by the governor there. But the Jesuits control her just like they control Arnold Schwarzenegger in California. The same Jesuit California provincial controls the California governor, the Arizona governor, the Hawaiian governor, and I believe the uh, Nevada governor. He controls that particular region of his province. So what they've done is now they have brought in all these alien Catholic Mexican invaders which are soldiers. They bring in their flag. They plant their flags at the post office, at the public schools, demanding this and that. They have no intention of being American. They want to reclaim the Southwest, claiming that it was taken from them illegally. And this is part of the Mecha Aslan uh, uh, rhetoric. So with this now, they have got the agitation with the Mexicans. Now they've got the agitation with the, with the good bill that was passed by all the whites now being driven into their corner. And so now we have the perfect place now to have a race war and when this race war starts I maintain they're going to ignite the black on white race war at the same time they ignite the Latino on white race war this will then drive all the whites to desperation Adolf Hitler will come to power Northcom NORAD uh, Department of Homeland Security will spring into action Blackwater will be with them which is run by the Knights of Malta and then they will come to the rescue and solve the problem and here we'll have no constitution and be under martial law and that's the purpose for the Mexican invasion that's why Janet Napolitano doesn't want to stop that's why George George Bush didn't want to stop. That's why Barry Davis Obama didn't want to stop. It's absolutely necessary to bring America to fascist martial law to have this alien Mexican Roman Catholic and even uh, is, uh, Islamic invasion because there are many Muslims there too. Yeah, and they can use uh, Arizona as a powder cake here by creating this type of strong legislation supposedly against illegal aliens. Yeah, why didn't they do it 20 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Why did they do it 25 years ago when it was just starting to happen? They waited until they have 40 million of them in the country. Now we'll pass this legislation. Now we can foment domestic insurrection and, and rebellion. And all the Mexicans you see, every last one of them is going to the concentration camps. That's why I tell you, Mexican people, you need to leave this country. You need to get back to Mexico as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I wanted to ask you what have you been? What's your research uh, centered on uh, in the last weeks or so? What's what's been on your mind lately, and what have you been talking about on your radio show a lot? Um, I talked about uh, George Allen, who was the past governor of Virginia. He was also uh, a U.S. senator from Virginia, uh, and what he did was he was to be really the foremost Republican candidate against uh, Obama well he was credible he did many good things but he was given an order and that order was to call a, an eastern Indian who was born in Virginia to call him a macaca a macaca is like using the term nigger or something like that to deliberately incite the listener and to then he would then come under attack he used the term macaca twice deliberately when he used this term macaca then everybody came out and said what are you doing using this name and then it turns out that his mother was was living in north africa and she had learned this term because this was the term used for the black congolese by, and during the days of uh, King Leopold II, and it was also a term used for East Indians that come here called the Macaca effect, that the East Indians take jobs that rightfully should be Americans. So when he used this term Macaca twice on video, <laughs> that completely caused him to lose the U.S. Senate race with, um, I believe the man was uh, Mr. Webb, Greg Webb. And so the Democrat won the U.S. Senate seat for Virginia, one of them, and that threw the, a majority Democratic vote in the Senate so that they could pass what Obama-Biden want. The second thing is he was to be the presidential nominee for the Republican Party. In 2006, in December, he withdraws because of this term that he used, and now he's not really fit to run, and that ensured that they would have that decrepit, 
uh, loser John McCain that would ensure an Obama-Biden victory, at least in appearance. So, I maintain this George Allen, and he now has what's called the Friends of George Allen. You can Google it. And it has 300 of the most powerful men you ever want to see. It's got Bill... And by the way, Gil, Bill Gates is funding the Gulen movement. Hmm. Uh, it's got, um, it's got uh, George W. Bush on there. It's got uh, uh, Carlucci, uh, uh, Frank C. Carlucci III, former, DC, uh, former Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, Carlisle Group. It's got several billionaires, many senators, other big bankers. Uh, Verizon, the head of Verizon, who's a not a multi, Bruce Babico, I believe. It's got all these power brokers that are the friends of George Allen. What for? Mm -hmm. What for? Because I maintain George Allen, who is now some sort of an authority at the Reagan Memorial Library. That's, what they, that's where they nested him. They're waiting to bring him to power or somebody like him. Waiting in the wings to then unite all the white people into their fascist movement. Because all of these agitations have been deliberately caused to bring some supreme fascist dictator to power, white fascist dictator to power. By the way, he's a Protestant, so we'll make him a Protestant. So we can't really trace it to Rome, right? Mm -hmm. and, then once, and then once he comes to power, then he'll implement all these Department of Homeland Security. Remembering, of course, that the Department of Homeland Security was created. It was, it's a design by John C. Gannon. John C. Gannon is a Knight of Malta. John C. Gannon was in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. John C. Gannon was an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. John C. Gannon's a Jesuit, and he created the Department of Homeland Security, which I call the Department of Homeland Security. So yeah, this what is I, what I, yeah, go ahead. Go so ahead. this is what I see with this George Allen, and that's, that was an article that I worked on, and then I just finished one on, on uh, Tim Russert yesterday. Yeah, I want to touch on Russert, uh, but first just let me mention this. Uh, when you're doing your research out there, listeners, uh, start at Georgetown. Start looking at a guy named Edmund Walsh, or Father Edmund Walsh, and then uh, go to Eric's book and start uh, tying the, uh, putting the dots together regarding all the people that have followed that man and the connections to them. You're going to be astounded how powerful these people are behind the scenes and uh, how mm -hmm. no one in America knows about it, and the news media doesn't want to cover it, and the reason is they protect Rome as well, and they protect the Knights of Malta because many of the, the top media people are involved in the same organizations, right, Eric? That's right. Henry Luz, the father of the Gannett newspapers and Time Life, he's a Knight of Malta. Cardinal Spellman's intimate friend. Remember, the, the press center of this country is Rockefeller Center, across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. The CIA is there. The CFR is there. And whatever comes out of that is run by the Knights of Malta and is facilitating the purposes of the papacy, which has quartered, is headquartered at St. Patrick's Cathedral, where the Knights of Malta are headquartered. So that is how we understand that. Jesuit Edmund Walsh, he himself was a Knight of Malta. Mm. Yeah. So, so they're organizing the press and, and they're orchestrating everything. And anybody that gets in their way, like Tim Russert, who was trained by Jesuit at Canisius, at Canisius High School in Buffalo, New York, he was trained by Jesuits at John Carroll University in Cleveland, who was the personal uh, gopher, the, 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 the helper for Patrick Monahan, that Jesuit who, that U.S. senator out of New York who was a Fordham uh, visiting lecturer, and he was also part of the cover-up in the JFK assassination. Uh, Tim Russert was absolutely in the Jesuit order's back pocket. They made him and created him, but when he started to go against... The, the story of 9-11, and when he started to infer that was, it was an inside job on June 1st, 2008, when he was uh, interviewing uh, McClellan, the Bush's uh, White House press secretary, uh, uh, what, 12 days later, he was dead. Right, and let's fill in, those, uh, fill in those 12 days. Now, we know that Russert also was one that he was a, what, he was a Meet the Press Sunday broadcaster, right? He had a big show. I, I'm not sure if it was Meet the Press. It was one it of was those Sunday shows. Meet the Press. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he was a very high uh, profile figure in the media, working for NBC, comes out of Jesuit University, has ties to Moynihan, like you said, uh, and then begins to look into 9-11 and, and starts to get the, uh, those, those broadcasts out about the possibility of it being an inside job. But he also starts interviewing Bush and Kerry regarding their skull and bones connections. <laughs> That's right. 
and uh, you know we and on this radio station you hear his voice most every day uh, is saying over and over again uh, well what does that mean for America and Bush says I have a you know whatever Bush says uh, so he then after that occurs uh, now he, he's talking about 9-11 is an inside job he takes a trip to Rome now, unbeknownst to many people he was in Rome just prior to his heart attack uh, right. supposedly, I believe at his son's graduation or something that fill in the dots there for us yeah, it was a celebration for his son's graduation at, from Boston College, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesuit Boston College, probably the, the second most powerful and largest Jesuit university in the country. And he was there for his celebration, and what does he do? He has an audience with Pope Benedict XVI. He leaves Rome, he comes back to the U.S., and his wife and his son stay in Rome. I find that intriguing. Yeah, I find that then, very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then not long after, he, he supposedly collapsed on the floor at NBC News. There, which appears to me that he is in cup, and that's pursuant to the Jesuit oath of the fourth vow. Mm -hmm. Someone gave him a cup of coffee, and that was his last cup of coffee. And uh, strange things, no autopsy, right? No autopsy. I have a whole list of anomalies on my site there for review. There's no aut autopsy. There's no. We don't even know the doctor's name who gave the autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a complete cover up in his murder, and, uh, and and nobody's talking about it. And obviously the Jesuit hands in it because he attacked the Iraqi war. He didn't want the war in Iraq. He he he. Uh, he he mentioned or tried to uh, lead on um, with the idea that it was a inside job of 9-11. Remember, they got rid of Lou Dobbs. They fired him. They got rid of uh, Montel Williams because of his position on the Iraqi war. All these people that are against the Iraqi war and maintaining that 9-11 is an inside job have no voice whatsoever in the national press, and some of them are relieved and others will be killed. All right, and this shows you they'll kill their own because they created... Uh they created Russert, then thought he was a loose cannon. They had to get rid of him, right? That's right. Just like Kennedy. And then if you look at all the reports, they eulogize him as, as if he was such a great man and right. as if he was always... They, they start talking about his strong Catholic roots right. and how he loved the papacy. Right. Uh, and the, and the, the other way. thing... Yeah, and the other thing now just occurred to me is that if anybody starts to get on the thought that he was murdered, why, it was Skull and Bones that did it. Mm -hmm. That Protestant operation, they did it. It wasn't the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. Failing to realize that the Jesuit William F. Buckley was skull and bones, not a Malta, and a host of other member of knighthoods. Yeah, I mean, that opens up the door to... Uh, we don't have to... In another show, we'll get into it again, the connection between Freemasonry and the papacy, mm -hmm. and how they use Freemasonry as basically the Protestant arm in this country. Just uh, in 30 seconds, uh, how important is that? Very important. That'll open up a lot of understanding, like J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, Eric, uh, I want to thank you for being on the show. I recommend... What time's your broadcast this afternoon? Tell people about it. It's 5 to 6, and I'm going to have a part 3 with our brother Marco Ponzi. I think you'll enjoy it concerning the alien deception, inv space alien deception invasion. Yeah. Okay, that's great, Eric. Thanks for being on the show, and stay tuned to Eric's show this afternoon on Liberty Radio. Thanks again, Eric. Thank you, Greg. Lord okay, bless. that was Eric John Phelps. Get his book, VaticanAssassins.org. And stay tuned for Tom Fress's show called Inquisition Update. You're listening to LibertyRadioLive.com. This is the Investigative Journal. The